Hello and welcome. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We are so excited to return for the 2020 contest year with our Ask an NEH Expert series. This year we're making a little bit of a shift. In the past, we focused these programs on different categories, you know, websites, exhibits, etc. But this year we're going to focus on some skills that are crucial to all of our students. So to get things started, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague Jason Harshman at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Thank you, Lynn. Hello and thank you to all of you for joining us for this video series. I'm Jason Harshman in the Division of Education at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Since the 1970s, the NEH has been a leading funder and supporter for National History Day, including the development of free resources available at our K-12 website at SiteMap. Each year, the NEH awards a special prize for working with the historical newspaper database Chronicling America and top projects with an NEH NHD Scholar Medal. It is our pleasure to once again partner with National History Day on the production of this Ask an Expert video series. I would like now to introduce Margaret Hughes from Historic Hudson Valley. Margaret is the Associate Director of, for Education at Historic Hudson Valley, and in this capacity, she oversees the public tour and school programs in five historic sites in Westchester County, New York. She also works on content development for on-site and online interpretive resources, including the newly launched interactive documentary, People Not Property, Stories of Slavery in the Colonial North, which was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Margaret also does consulting work on school program development for art and history museums, and has been a judge for the Lower Hudson National History Day regional competition for five years. I would like to welcome Margaret, and now that we are ready to begin our discussion about building an argument, I'll turn it back to Lynn from National History Day. Thank you so much, Jason. And Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. And like Jason said, Margaret is one of our NHD judges, so she's absolutely <laughs> an expert that we want to be listening to. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about building an argument, and that's something that all of our NHD students need to do. Oftentimes, arguments start as research questions. So Margaret, can you talk a little bit about the components of a good research question and some things that our students might want to keep in mind as they design and revise their research questions throughout the course of the research process? Absolutely, and I'd like to say thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I love National History Day and am thrilled to, uh, to see what the students of this year have coming up. Um, when we're looking at the finished product, it's sort of daunting to think back to all of the steps that you need to go through, but it's critical that you master all of those steps in the research process in order to get to your cumulative project. And the research question is where you begin with all of that. You should start with a topic that you are familiar with. You you're going to be spending a lot of time with this topic. So you wanna choose a topic that interests you and that you already have a grounding in because the whole point of this is to dig deeper, to delve into the, the historic record and to make your own assessment about this topic and um, content. What you want from a research question or for, from a few research questions um, is really these research questions give you as the researcher direction for your research. Uh, the historic record is broad and deep and for any given topic there are many different paths that you could take. So you want research questions that will help to guide your research and make sure that you're on the right path and have something to work toward. It's going to be a guide for you to do your research around um, and it should be based around um, your knowledge of this topic. You should choose a question that really interests you that gets at maybe a complexity to a particular time period or a subject that you'd like to know more about. It should be clear. You want something that really helps to focus your research and complex, one that really gets at some of the questions of history, of the stuff of history. Um, but you want something that um, will keep you focused and that can't be explained really easily. When you're looking for a research question, you don't want to look for a yes or a no answer. You want to look toward the hows and the whys, really getting at what happened, why did it happen this way, how might it have happened differently, what's the implication for this. So really use this as an opportunity to, to set the path for yourself, but really to get a sense of just how complex the stuff of history can be. 
Okay, I, I like that idea that, you know, you're really kind of narrowing down your focus on a particular topic. So I want to kind of think about this from our students perspective. They have started the year, they chose their topics, they've done some research. Hopefully they've written a good history, a research question or questions that help narrow their research and kind of focus their topic. And a lot of our students at this point of the year have a whole lot of stuff and they have a good knowledge of their topic. Can you then explain to them, when we talk about building a historical argument, can you explain what that means, knowing that they know their topic pretty well at this point in the year? This is where it can be kind of daunting because a historical argument is the stuff of history. And being a historian, a historic argument is where you, having gathered all of this expertise in your topic, having gone through archives, having read primary, secondary sources, the argument is where you bring all of those things together and where you stake your claim on this is how you're going to interpret this history. This is you really saying, this is the importance that I place on these sources. This is why I believe these things work together, these different um, stories. These are coming together in this way. And you as, as the historian get to stake a claim. It can be kind of daunting because this is the same process that any published historian goes through. And um, I think sometimes students sort of can be nervous about really making an argument, but that's what it is. It's an argument to say, I've looked at things from a lot of different perspectives. I've consulted these valid sources, and this is what I think they all mean in totality. It, um, it's important that your historic argument is also something that someone else could take a different point of view on. So you don't want to restate information. Um, you don't want to state that the Civil War happened from 1861 to 1865, but you want to say that these different factors came together influencing um, this group of people, this group of people, with the result of, and to state the result that you've come up with. So you really want to avoid using your argument, uh, your thesis argument to state facts, but really to say, this is what we're going to get to. And then in the course of your argument, you back up the thesis with um, your, your historic facts um, to support your, your claim. Absolutely. And I think in a lot of ways, sometimes students get nervous because if they have a particular topic, like we use causes of the Civil War here, other students might be looking at the same topic or the same time period. What are some ways that an argument can help take two projects on the same topic and differentiate them? Absolutely. Because an argument is not about restating facts, an argument is about your analysis of what happened. Um, I think if we look today at sort of different ways that the Constitution is interpreted, some historians put primacy on the intent of the founders of that document at the time period, while other interpreters sort of look at how we might see the meaning of that document evolve over time, we can get a sense of um, how history can be read from different lenses and the different ways that you place emphasis on that information is going to lead to your argument about a, a given topic being very different from a colleague's argument on the topic. Absolutely, and I think too, once we get to this point and students kind of have an argument and they've got this thesis statement, they think they know where they're going with it, what kinds of suggestions can you give them about crafting that argument so that it gets pulled through either their exhibit board or their documentary or their paper? What kind of tips can you give about crafting that argument and weaving it into what they're building? So you want to start with your strong thesis statement. I think we, we often talk about the thesis statement, um, and it's because it's really central. The thesis is where you say up front, this is what I believe these facts mean put together, and this is the interpretation I'm putting on those. And you want to put that right up front. In education, we have um, sort of a mantra that you tell people what you're going to teach them, you teach it to them, and then you tell them what you've taught them. And I think a historic argument works in much the same way. Up front, you wanna be really clear with your audience, whether it's people who are going to read an essay or people who are gonna look at your exhibit board, you wanna be really clear about exactly what 
you are going to say what you think all of this information means. And then you go through in your supporting elements. For an essay, that's going to be the different paragraphs that build up your essay. For an exhibit board, it's going to be the different panels and the way that you make some of the panels larger or smaller depending on how big a point or a small a point you're trying to make. Um, for um, one of the performances, it's making sure that the different characters and acts within a production sort of support the different things that you're getting at. So you start with your thesis, you let everybody know what that is, and then you use all of the supporting elements within that um, to back that up. So in an essay, you would use one paragraph to emphasize a particular point. You would use a second paragraph, a third paragraph, and so on, sort of making it really clear. With the, po the point of an argument is to win someone over to your side, to stake a claim and to explain to them why this makes sense. So you wanna be as clear as possible and you wanna make sure that your audience is really familiar um, through, through the work that you do with where you're pulling this information from and why you're staking these claims. You've done the research, you wanna make it really clear to everyone that this is how it should be read and this is why it should be read in that way. And then you wanna wrap up with a conclusion that really helps to bring all of those things together that brings us back to the thesis and hopefully goes a little bit uh, forward from there. Okay, so one thing that I think is really interesting is that as you're crafting your argument, you mentioned that we need to support it with primary sources and with the research that you've done. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of historical evidence and the role that primary sources play as you're crafting that argument throughout the course of your documentary or performance or website? Absolutely. So primary documents really are the stuff of history. It's the evidence, it's the, um, the, the letters that were written, diaries, it's maps that might have been created, political cartoons. It's anything, primary sources are anything that were created at the moment, um, the time period that you are writing about. And I think often because they are um, oftentimes old documents, we tend to give them this primacy. And I think it's really important as we're working with primary sources to remember that they were created by humans who were coming at the creation with a particular point of view. In the case of letters, often it's two people who are in conversation with each other, maybe one trying to win over the other to an argument, just as kind of like what you're trying to do in your work here. So we need to take that into account when we are consulting primary sources. Absolutely, they are imperative to the written record, but we also have to make sure that we're asking questions of them. Who created this document? For what purpose was it created? If it's a letter uh, between two individuals, are there other letters in a chain of communication that could help us understand the role that this document played um, within the, the group? Or is there a letter to another individual that might have a slightly different slant on it? Is there a difference between a letter and a diary that show us that maybe uh, the letter was written with a little bit more of an intent than a personal diary that was never intended for public use might have been anticipated? So I think we really have to grapple with these primary sources, analyze them. It's not enough just to say, this historic document, this primary document says this, but you really need to explain to us, well, why does that matter? Why does that support what you're trying to accomplish with your historic arguments? I think when we're thinking broadly about the sources that we are using and how we're crafting our arguments, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that if you know that there has been some um, question or debate around your topic in the historic field, especially since that time period, it's really important for you to acknowledge that so that you're letting people know that you are aware of the broader conversation that's happening. It might not change the way that you're interpreting the material, but it's letting your audience know that you're familiar with these um, questions and considerations. And even in spite of it, you're still staking a claim or you've reread your source. And because of this conversation, you're changing the way that you're looking at, at a historic document. One example of this is Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, it's a terrific book that really um, we understand to have been fundamental in the way that, the, um, that slavery was understood in American society at that time period. Since the publication of that book, there have been 
uh, real issues brought up relating to its portrayal of African Americans in the book. And although the book is understood to have been sympathetic to the abolitionist cause, it still is problematic in its depictions. So we would want to address that that has been something that's come forward since the time of the publication, even though we understand it to be a really dynamic primary source document. Absolutely. Those primary sources are tricky. And I think it's important, too, that students really look at them critically. And also, though, let them drive your interpretation. Because it's important that we don't just pick an argument and then find the documents to support it, but let the documents or sources that we find help drive our argument. I'll also give a little tip, students. Be careful relying too much on secondary sources. They are absolutely a key point of the research process, but you don't want to rely on a historian to write your interpretation for you. Because we see that sometimes. Students will put quotes from secondary sources and try to let them tell the story, and we don't want you to do that. We want you to tell the story. We want your voice and interpretation to be held. Okay, let me ask you one other question, Margaret. All of our students have limits, right? So they either have word limits or time limits. And sometimes yeah. as they're working on their projects, they really struggle and they get up to the end and they get to that conclusion. You know, kind of that last five to 10% of their project and they don't really know what to do. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of conclusions and how you help students or with suggestions to create a conclusion that really has a purpose and isn't just kind of the thesis statement with a couple words switched around? <laughs> It's a, um, a great point to make because it's helping us to understand why this topic is so important, why this historic experience still matters and affects the lives of us even today, perhaps centuries after the time period that you've been writing about. It's the why should I care um, kind of example. I pulled together actually an example um, of this. I do a lot of work with um, slavery in America and particularly here at Historic Hudson Valley, we look at slavery in the North, which is sometimes an area that's less understood. And I put together maybe an example of a conclusion that would help bridge that connection between not just the historic time period, but what does that mean for us today? So I suggested by focusing the slavery in America as primarily as a phenomenon of the antebellum South, we overlook the importance of slavery to the development of the American economy and the political system. As a result, we marginalize the importance of slavery throughout American history and the roles of enslaved people in the development of this country. So what I was trying to do was to indicate that we need to look more carefully at the at this particular time period, this other overlooked time period of American history, but get you to the point of understanding why does it matter that we've been looking um, very slantedly at one topic, at one way of looking at slavery in America, that we need to pull this connection forward to the present, that the way that we understand the past has this sort of real implication for what it might mean um, moving forward. That allows you to draw some 21st uh, century parallels. And I think that's really what's important here is to help the audience understand not just, okay, this is an interesting and new way to look at this historic period, but what does it really mean for me? What does it really mean for our American experience today to understand this history the way that you have just presented it to me? I think that's a really good point. And you did a nice job of kind of encapsulating in about three or four sentences, what I always call that so what question. That's so what paragraph. Yeah. And that's, I think, a great way to describe conclusions as the way to wrap up your argument. And it's still a part of it. It's not just the sentence we drop at the end because we only have six words left or we only have 20 <laughs> seconds and we've got to get our credits to scroll on our documentary. Excellent. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for all of the ideas and thoughts that you have shared with our NHD students and teachers. And I'm going to turn things over to Jason Harshman from the NEH to wrap our program today. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And of course, yes, thank you, Margaret. I'll echo what, what Lynn said. This was, this was fantastic insight and advice and the examples that uh, are applicable to any project uh, for, for the students and of course, informing teacher, uh, teachers and how they support students. So thank you so much for your time today. And of course, thank you. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and, and is watching this video series. We hope that you find them to be, to be helpful throughout the year, as well as uh, with forthcoming projects. 
On behalf of the National Endowment for the Humanities and our website project at Simon, we wish you all the best with your National History Day projects. Thank you.